I love this text. I love this text because it's full of little bizarre good nuggets. I love this text because it's about Philip and it's not about Peter and it's not about Paul and it's not about anyone you know. We don't know much about Peter. I love this text because it's about the church before there's a book of order or a constitution. I love this text because we have no idea what's going on in Philip's brain. Philip just keeps having to say yes. Yes to the spirit. Yes to the eunuch. Yes to the people he finds himself suddenly with. I love this text because it doesn't happen at home. It doesn't happen in a sanctuary. It happens out on the road. What kind of road, mind you? A wilderness road, right? The text in parentheses, mind you, as a great lover of parenthetical thought, I'm a big fan of that too. In parentheses, it just throws in there, this was a wilderness road. Why? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why is that pertinent to the story? Why does the the text that doesn't make it necessarily a core piece of the text, but makes a moment to pause the action of the story to say to you, this was a wilderness road, think that's relevant to us. That, my friends, ended up being my whole sermon. So forget all the rest of the text. This was a wilderness road. This is the word of the Lord. So I'm fond of wilderness. Um, I'm fond of wilderness as a provocative place of life. Um, That in wilderness, in the barrenness of wilderness, Scripture finds the new thing God is doing. That's not an Acts story. That's a Scripture story. Uh, When I'm driving back from visiting my family in Chicago, there's a favorite place that we get to in the drive. It's where I call when the rows of cornfields turn into rows of snow fences in east central Wyoming. And my heart knows I'm home. This was a wilderness road. So I'm drawn to wilderness, and I was drawn to that line this week, and um, one of the things that is true in wilderness is that it's quieter, right? And um, it turns out I also really love the song, The Sound of Silence, and so I thought, oh, I'm going to make the call to worship the song, The Sound of Silence. So we're about to journey through the mind of Andrew in a week leading up to worship. So uh, it's Monday, and after Easter, I am no more than six days worship planning ahead of myself. Um, So it's Monday, and I'm like, oh, that'd be fun. Let's do the sound of silence call to worship. And then I decided that if the neon lights appeared in the call to worship, you all would look at me weird. So I didn't use any of the lyrics of the song, The Sound of Silence. But this is just how Google works. Like the third hit down was... Uh, a Time Magazine article about the power of silence. And is silence golden? And if you're Andrew, you don't not click on that link. So I began to read about this study done into what happens to mice in a completely silent room. And uh, they get, two things happens to them according to this study. They get agitated, and their neural readouts tell you their brains are growing. Agitated into neural growth. That's weird. That's weird. Is that weird? So then the article takes you into this thing, and I know some of this, but a lot of this was new to me. The difference between distress and, shall we say, eustress. Right? So, and this, this requires, this helps to have a little bit of prefix knowledge. So the dis on stress means um, it's 
it's disabling, it's destructive, it's bad. Distress is not a good thing. You didn't need me to tell you that, right? Eustress takes the E-U prefix, which means good on the word stress, and talks about good stress, provocative stress, stress that creates growth. And it says that when these mice experience the sound of actual silence, they get this kind of productive stress. I'm fascinated by this because um, it, if you get into the neural psychology of stress, when we run into a threat, right, our body experiences stress. You don't have to think it, it just happens, right? Threat occurs, you get stressed, your body pumps out adrenaline and other drugs into your system to make you Run faster, be stronger. Devin there asked me, is dad strength a thing once at my Super Bowl party, I think. And I said, well, I've never lifted a car off my kids, so I don't know about that level of dad strength. But, but yeah, adrenaline kicks in, and we're meant then to physically be at the peak performance so we can overcome this thing that has inspired fear in us. However, those chemicals are destructive to our neural processing. Distress over long-term experience, destroys our ability to think well. This is the world of trauma. This is the world of continue churning and working without ever stopping to rest or to process or to heal or to care about yourself. We find ourselves making terrible decisions. Meg Short said it from Faces of Hope. The traumatized brain makes decisions other people judge as bad decisions, but it, it is chemically incapable of making good decisions. It has experienced the stress response so long, the debilitating part of the chemical is all that's experienced anymore. And I think, just put a pin in this thought, most of the world is there right now. Most of the world is stuck there right now and it's why none of us are our better selves eustress on the other hand is is when one greets an a challenge an opportunity but it intrigues them they receive it not as something to be feared but as something to be overcome something that forces creativity upon them something they didn't necessarily expect and they may be agitated because it's still change and it's still outside your comfort zone but you end up overcoming this obstacle and you get this almost internal euphoria of I did it I remember I remember hitting mile 10 in Roby Creek as this non-runner. I remember coming out at the summit of Adalpe where, frankly, honestly, everyone except for gross people like Andrew are really walking at that time, right? We're not running. We're walking because we're, we're going straight uphill, right? I remember coming up over that and just feeling the power of going downhill because I could not go downhill at that point because I didn't have enough energy left. But you've overcome a challenge, and you feel the positive energy of overcoming that challenge, even though you can't walk tomorrow. Right? That's you stress. That is life-giving. And according to neuroscientists, your neurons are actually growing from it. Your brain is gaining capacity because of that experience. Now, you're all looking at me going, Andrew, this is worship, not science class. Interestingly, that article went on to talk about the fact that, according to people who measure such things, the amount of noise, sound, that our ears takes in doubles every decade. The world is getting twice as loud every 10 years. Because of the amount of things that make noise in it. The, uh, whether it's your Apple Watch telling you to breathe, or whether it's the songs on the radio, or the person who's come into the bathroom with their phone on speakerphone and somehow thinks that's appropriate, 
right? We are beset by noise, and the level that we've begun to tolerate grows annually, doubles by the decade. That came up here in a worship meeting. Well, this is really going to rile you up. When some folks were saying, can we tell people to be quiet during the prelude? I want to hear the prelude, but I can't because it's so loud out there. And I'm like, here's the problem. We can, and everyone out there will agree that's a great message. Because no one out there thinks they're the loud person. Because the levels are just rising. In that moment, silence is so much more disconcerting because nothing about our life is quiet. We bought a house that was owned by a smoke jumper. That sounds great, right? But the, but the fire detectors are wired to that house. I'm pretty sure the apocalypse can happen and my smoke detectors will still work. And when you cook pizza, that's a terrible thing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. When it's saving my life, I'm loving it. But we just don't experience silence. Now, what does this have to do with anything? What if I got up and read in Scripture, this was a wilderness road? Imagine with me for a moment, Philip is in Antioch. Imagine for me a moment that Philip is a leader of the church in Antioch, the first place they began to call us Christians. Antioch, whose population density was more dense than Manhattan in the first century. Where it is said at night you could hear buildings collapsing for the weight of the residents in them. Imagine he's on the streets of Antioch and he's headed to, I don't know, a session meeting. For you non-Presbyterians, those are our governing board meetings. And this person stops him and says, what's to keep me from being baptized? Do you think Philip even hears the question? Do you think Philip will stop himself when he's late to a meeting? Do you think Philip beset by the noise of life, is in the position to say, yes, and. No. This was a wilderness road. And I have to imagine that where that's relevant is it is because Philip has been... <laughs> not by his choosing, sent out on this wilderness road that Philip is leaning into the silence of that place. Philip is leaning into the what is new, springing up. Do you not perceive it, as the prophet Isaiah says, of that place? And so when that clattering, loud chariot is bouncing its way down the road with its chattering eunuch trying to make sense out of the story he cannot wrap his mind around, walks into or rolls into Philip's life, he is in a place to say yes. He doesn't experience fear which leads to distress, which leads to being shut down, cut off. He experiences opportunity, which creates eustress, which makes him think about what all can happen here. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that together. This was a wilderness road. Where are you 
finding that kind of provocative silence in your life that you can open yourself up to hear that crazy Holy Spirit saying, And your first instinct is to say, this is the word of our Lord.